The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Today in the engine room, I'm joined by Paul Barrett of Absolute Wealth Advisors. This is one of the more, more sort of fulfilling interviews I'm going to do because uh, Paul's business partner, Dean Holmes, has been a, a friend of mine for 18 years and just off camera, um, he said, uh, when he worked with you, um, you kind of uh, warmed him up to work with me and he's the best business partner ever. So it is good to see those uh, sort of progressions with, with people. But without any further ado, welcome to the engine room, Paul Barrett. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm good. Great, in you, fact. You're great. And look, thanks for um, coming in on a Friday to see me. And um, look, what I always love to start with is just a bit about you. You know, what brought you to here? Because every backstory really predicates what people are doing now and their beliefs and whatnot. So how did you get started? And more importantly, how have you evolved to run uh, a successful financial services firm? Yeah, good, good question. And I think this will resonate with some people. I think when you go through school, you either have a good idea of what you want to do or you don't. Um, and I, I had a good idea of what I wanted to do. I'd love to be a professional sportsman or in the sports industry and I wasn't good enough at either. So um, I had to just take a, a stab in the dark at what I'd study. So I thought, well, working in and around money, at least if I'm unhappy, I'd have some money to spend. So uh, I went in and studied economics and I just followed that path into banking, finance and and had a good good roles there. I worked for ANZ for a number of years, then I went over into CBA. Um, while I was at CBA, I helped set up and run a, a billion dollar global bond fund cool. while I was there and then I went from there to work for uh, a listed um investment company at the time it was called record investments and uh i used to call it the finance olympics we were financing 747 aircraft ships leased to the u.s military trains buildings photocopiers artwork just anything you could finance i did it and it was the finance olympics and you were always uh it felt like you were competing with the smartest people in the room every day um, which was excellent and, and I did meet some fantastic people, but it was hard work. It was 60 to 80 hours a week and ultimately for me there was not as much fulfilment in it. And so I actually went to a head... And, and can I ask you, hmm. why did you think there wasn't that much fulfilment at the time? Because, and as simple as I could say it, my job was fighting with other titans over basis points on a deal and, and that didn't turn me on. Right. So huge amount of complexity, like there was a, a sense of pride, but there was a, a constant level of stress and what I was fighting over wasn't meaningful for me. Well, there you go. And so I went to a headhunter and said, look, I can finance anything. This is what I've done. What should I do next? And it's a shame I can't remember his name, but he gave me the best advice, which other people have heard before, but look, mate, go away, have a think about what you'd do if you didn't have to work for money and then work out how to make money out of doing that. And so I took that literally to heart and went, when I'm in flow or what I love doing most is talking to people I care about, about things that matter to them. 
And so I went, well, how do I do that? And I went, well, I could go and restudy to be a psychologist and, and that's what my mother is. Um, so I knew that road. But, you know, that would be a massive step backwards and, and I'd also be throwing away this amazing skill set that I had, which I knew was pretty rare. Um, so financial planning was the natural step. So I went and studied and then started in financial planning in 2004 in a, in a broad practice um, and that's where I met Dean. And so Dean and I hired Dean in to, I was at that practice for four years. I hired Dean in after about the two-year point and after working together for two years, we both actually independently decided we wanted to leave but then we figured out we were both looking to leave and we said, well, let's go and do something together. And so then we looked for an opportunity and we found a, a practice that had recently had its employee leave and its owner wasn't engaged in the business. So we went and for, for the first 12 months, we just acted as consultants. We consulted to his clients and worked on my clients. We had a revenue sharing and then we bought, over time, we bought him out and, and that was from 2008 onwards and we've just grown the business from there. And so... I'll ask you a question, and, and look, I do. I was worried when you said that um, uh, the recruiter said, "What would you do if you didn't have to work for money?" And you're like, "Financial planning." But um, for everyone out there, it, it's um, it, I suppose it really goes to the point that that if you are working with something you're passionate about, it, it, it follows. But you, so you're, you're, you're there. You've, um, you've you've found a business partner. You've uh, you've bought out someone in 2008. Hits 2009. Um, how did that impact you? Because there was a little event in our financial planning history yeah. that um, may have um, may have been relevant. And did you learn any lessons from that? Yeah, and so that 2008 uh, was the first time I really felt like I'd ever had people I cared about who were now feeling the financial stress from the advice that I'd given them. And not that it was bad advice, it was just that everything was tanking and I'd never experienced that before. Yep. I'd never really had a major loss on any deal that I'd been involved in. Um, and look, I'm not ashamed to say that that really did affect me emotionally and mentally. And so I had to, I had to work through that. I had good support around me at the time. It didn't last very long. Um, and I got the right help. So look, very stressful. Um, but learnt a lot out of that. Right. And if, if there was one thing that's probably shaped our business from that time is that complex products that that say that they are going to work well in certain situations almost always don't. And so keep away from complex things because A, the client will never understand it, which means you're trading on trust. And as soon as anything goes wrong, it's your trust that's broken. Yep. And as soon as trust is broken, your relationship may never recover. So we now do very simple things and we make sure that the clients understand it and that they own the decision. And we, uh, we ha almost have zero ever clients call us whenever the markets are going down, uh, literally zero. Uh, the great irony of your comments there is that although you're intimating that you do things very simply, a quick look at the clientele that you have is that you deal with very high net worth people, worth tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And for those who are listening who are new to this, quite often it is the more simple and the clearer the articulation of what you can offer for someone who has got a very busy life um, is the key. Would you would you agree with that? Look, I think that what a lot of happens in financial planning is you often attract the people who are aligned with the way you think. And so I became aware some time ago that one of the paradigms in financial planning or finance was that anybody who had money was financially sophisticated and, and their ego was wrapped up in making more money and it's absolutely not the case. There are so many people out there who have money who they didn't make it, they've received it through inheritance or divorce or, um, you know, the family has had a business and made money um, and they literally are not engaged in wanting to eke out the, the last basis point or, um, you know, being in the latest sexy thing. They want simple admin, they want money in their bank once a month to spend, they want money available when they need it and they just want peace of mind. And so... I target people who have money but who don't want to be in commercial property or, you know, buying BHP, selling BHP, buying Rio, ANZ. Like they're just not into it. And there is a huge market out there for those type of people and that's who we target. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And we, we'll talk a bit more about sort of your your goals and your philosophy later on. And I just thought I'd sort of uh, shift up the gears because 
Um, we were talking earlier, this is a, a an engine room podcast, which goes into sort of the business of the business. And um, you've recently hired a new practice or a practice manager, mm-hmm. um, a Jan, is that that's correct? Right. Jan Humphreys, yep. Yep. Um, who uh, we who we thought we won't drag in here to do a practice management after six weeks tenure. No, but the good news is, is what you say today will be the the blueprint of what 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 your business practice manager has to do. So maybe yep. explain why you've hired Jan and and, and mm. what what role do you see her bringing to your operations? Yep. So. One of our guiding philosophies is that we think uh, profitability is more important than revenue and profitability is driven by um, minimizing the highest cost resources and, and building out lower cost resources to make the higher cost resources more efficient. This could be an adult channel with that one <laughs> sentence, couldn't it? You know? <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> um, and so we, we are growing and we could have kept throwing advisors at the problem but where an advisor had to do a multitude of managing staff and also managing clients. And we went, that's just not the way forward. The way forward is to have somebody skilled, like super skilled, at the administration, compliance, advice delivery, um, advice execution, so that the basically what we want is the most efficient meeting booking process, meeting preparation process, and the advisor shouldn't really be involved in any of that. The advisor should be receiving a comprehensive pre-meeting pack of information. They should have a great meeting with the client where they're focused on the relationship and, and the stuff they need to get out of the meeting. And then they need a simple as possible way of downloading the key takeaways from that meeting to the advice delivery team, but having a skilled person do that. What we had before was a huge amount of great... Uh, we had great specialists, but... We sort of didn't have that role where the knowledgeable person was guiding them other than the financial advisor, and that was a distraction for the advisor. So we're removing the distraction for the advisor, getting this hugely technically competent person to now manage all advice delivery, and we're super excited about it because advisors don't like doing all that other stuff. And just like that, Jan, we wrote your job description. (laughs) Oh, she knows. So um, maybe uh, give me a bit of a feel for the organisational structure of your business. Uh, you, you've got your multi-AR business, you've got uh, support, but yeah, give us an idea of how it works um, in, your, in your business. Mm-hmm. So when we started, Dean and I were both advisors. Um, and within about a year, we took in our first staff member, Stella Norberti. And within a couple of years, Stella became an advisor and an owner in the business. Correct. So really for um, you know probably a good 12 odd years, we've had three advisors mm-hmm. in the business. But then what happened was Dean has gone off and created the Wealth Network, which is our um, practice business coaching business. Lots of people would know Dean and the Wealth Network. Um, And so he has gradually moved over there. So he's stopped advising now. And so we brought in another advisor. Um, So that's Anthony McGuinness. Um, And he was uh, a super smart guy physics degree, business degree, MBA, uh, financial planning. But he came into us with a bit of a career change and it was kind of like I gave him the same advice that um, I was given and he chose financial planning. He used to work for Deutsche Bank for 10 years and then Avalok and he really wanted to get into the people side of finance. Um, So he's come in, he's done his PY with us. Um, he's uh, basically becoming, he's getting off his PY any day and he's been so good that he's becoming a full-blown advisor and buying into the practice as of July. Fantastic. So, I mean, one of the other questions I always ask is um, uh, what makes people stay in your practice? But, um, you know, having a very open and transparent sort of ownership model is definitely one of those. And do, do you arrange your, your support team into, into pods or do you have a centralized system for sort of the delivery of, of, of your services? That's a great question because we've tried and failed uh, quite a bit. Yeah, let's go through them because yeah. this is what we're learning from. So the first thing we tried without, well, well, before we even were outsourcing, we had that basically advisor, associate advisor model where the associate advisor would do everything. Yep. Um, and that worked when our practice was small, but it, it just ends up you don't have enough man hours to do all of the things that you need to do to give great service. And so when we knew that model was broken, we, we looked to go outsourcing, but we went first of all to one of those outsourcing teams where you've got two or three allocated staff, but they work for other practices as well. And you put, put and 
that was terrible. We spent two years trying to make that work. And because they're working for multiple practices, um, they wouldn't, we couldn't control them. They were doing the same thing three or four different ways. So there were errors, there were delays. It was just. When you say it out loud, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? I know. It's, um, and, and, and they're also not aligning with your culture and, and your personality. And they're not, not their fault, not their fault. No. But yeah, so, so then, then how did that play out? So the next thing is we, uh, we went to, uh, BA Platinum. And that's been amazing. So from day one, we had dedicated staff and we, we literally call them our staff. This is not offshoring outsourcing. These are just our staff who work overseas. Um, and again, we started with that one person does all, but now that person was supporting an associate advisor, was supporting an advisor. But we also quickly worked out again that there was too much for them. Like, because they would do certain things infrequently, they would make mistakes, they would be relearning, it was inefficient. So ultimately where we've ended up is specialising and it works for them and it works for us. So we have an insurance specialist who does all of the insurance work for all the advisors. We have an investment specialist, we're about to hire our second one, does all the investment work for all of the advisors. We have two power planners, they do all the power planning for all of the advisors. We have one CSO, uh, well, sorry, we've got two CSOs. They both do all of the extra jobs outside of those specialist jobs. But the other specialist jobs, which we now have four people doing this role, two supporting each main advisor, um, are what we call advisor support specialists. And they're the people who schedule the meetings, book the meetings, do the meeting prep, coordinate the rest of the team, deliver the, inf- the meeting prep information, receive the file notes, outsource the tasks from there. So... They're the engine room behind the um, advice client journey, but then we've got those other specialists implementing all of the specialty elements of the financial plan, and it seriously works fantastic. Yeah, look, and, and um, uh, having that specialisation in your, your operations is something that people don't immediately um, uh, plan to do, but um, it's mad not to. Um, and I, I, on your website, it looks like you're a one team, one dream, and um yeah, shout out to uh, Brian and the team over there with VA. I've, um, um, I'm in that game as well, and 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 uh, he spent he spent the time and effort getting his his data security uh, tip top. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's good outcome for all. Um, is my thoughts. Yeah, and look, we you know the competition to that model is us going over and, and hiring people ourselves, and there is no way that we were going to do that. It's not good for the for them. Um, even though they might get paid a bit more, they don't get all the health benefits, they don't get the medical care, they don't get all the training and support, uh, they don't get the tech support, and we don't want to have to manage all of that. So the job that VA Platinum do for us in hiring and managing the team over there, even though they work for us, is invaluable. Yeah, perfect. And that also leads me to, um, you know, a bit more of the risk management side around, you know, how are you licensed? Mm-hmm. Um, are you self-licensed? Or- I can't remember. So, yep. How are you licensed at the moment? So, interestingly, we um, were self-licensed back in 2011. Yep. Um, we were licensed to Fitzpatrick's, who were great for us, were great to us. Sorry, we were we were licensed by Fitzpatrick's in 2009 through to 2011. We went self-licensed in 2011 through to 2022. So that was a good sort of 10 year, 11 years. We in 2022 we basically all moved all of our licensed our advisors' cars off to um, Paragem, which is owned by Diverger. Now, how did that journey happen? Well, originally it was just absolute wealth advisors, but with Dean's TWN business, the wealth network business, every time we would bring on a new financial planning firm, which is what we do, we would take equity in them so we could provide them free, cash flow free coaching for five years, and then they would just buy us out of our equity, equity, but we ended up with five or six practices under our license, and we had to start throwing resources at the license to say compliant, and that was never a job that any of us wanted to do. It was, it's nobody wants to pay for it, everybody's arguing about it, it's not profitable, and it's all risk. So we just divested of that business, and we are so happy to now not be self-licensed, and we're really, really happy with the service we've received from Paragem. Anyone in particular want to give a shout out to at Paragem? Craig Kamanas is, certainly is our, our go-to guy, but we also know um, Nathan 
uh, and uh, Nathan Jacobson, and he's also been very supportive of us um, uh, in many, many ways. So another one of the things in the way we want to say thanks to um, Diverger and, and Craig and Nathan is that they've super supported Dean and his business coaching, business improvement business. So they now run uh, a a coaching business within the Diverger business, um, but Dean is the engine behind it. And so they promote it. We're we're getting clients from them, um, and it's a symbiotic thing. So they believe in us and our methodologies, and they're supporting us, which is amazing for a um, for a licensee to do that. And as I'm as I'm here chatting to you today, I'm, I'm taking notes down that I I best give uh, Dean a call and bring him and drag him in front of here and get his insight. So we might be hearing from Dean the next couple of months as as well. And um, you you've mentioned a couple of um uh, interesting things in that you've taken uh, shares in other businesses. Mm-hmm. How is how are you guys owned? Are you, are you owned? Do you have a board structure? What what's the mechanics of where you are now? Or maybe what your aspirations are. So uh, we've always had like a, um, a head entity which owns all of our sub-entities um, and Dean, myself and Stella each have a family trust and that's how we, we own entity in the headstock yep. which then flows down to, the, um, to all the subsidiaries that we have. And one thing that we're doing though now is we've – this has been a, a, a slow burn between the, the – practice coaching, the wealth network, and absolute wealth advisors. And so what we're doing now is we're splitting that ownership so that the people who are directly involved in absolute wealth advisors will own shares in absolute wealth advisors. The people who are involved in the coaching will own the shares in the coaching. And and that's just better aligning something that just merged over time into something that probably was less equitable because of contributions and Well the great irony is is the idea around um, coaching and assisting in those those businesses, um, the genesis of that was years ago. But um, mm. from an outside looking in, a lot of those businesses are killing it. Have got really big, yeah. and uh, I would safely say that that if um, if the trajectory keeps going, that I'm surprised that private equity haven't already knocked on your on your door. But um, that's probably for another discussion, another time. But um, uh, well, look, some, there's some secret sauce in there, and, and you know, and you know, there's no secret. And I told you before that that's where we see the future of our business, which is um, we want to get to uh, a 40% profit margin and uh, at least $5 million because I think that's the entry point for private equity. Now, they could go and buy a commercial property, which has got a, you know, a 5% yield on it, um, or they could buy a, a high-quality, um, very compliant, growing financial planning practice, which has got a 40% profit margin. Now, um, Private equity should be pretty interested in that. Well, let's talk about then um, how that actually translates to the coalface. So mm. at the moment, um, you've got your advisors and maybe give me a feel for what they're currently managing, whether it be people or revenue per advisor today mm. and, and where you think it could go. Mm. So at the moment, our target is a million dollars worth of revenue per advisor. Now, in our practice, we've got two different advisors, Stella and Anthony. Now, Anthony is supporting me. But in that, Stella, her passion and her client base is more around the uh, pre-retirees. So it's sort of probably a million to two million worth of retirement funds. Um, they've got, a, you know, they own their house, but they want to, ma- you know, they're, they're not, they've not got too much money. So they're quite carefully managing their money and, and there can be some Centrelink stuff in there um, that she manages, whereas I'm much more interested in the larger more complex, large. So Stella what might have, so we actually are looking at how many meetings can we have a year and we're trying to up that to sort of 10 meetings per week over 40. So, you know, it's about 400 meetings and now we've got to work out, well, is your client base all just annual review clients so you can have 400 clients or is my client base over here, I give them four meetings a year so I can only have 100 clients That's and right. the pricing has to reflect that. So. Um, that's where we know our activity is and that's how we plan based on meetings and revenue. And um, we've gone across licensing, but, but what technology do you use? So interestingly, we thought deeply about this. So, funnily enough, Dean 
One of the reasons we went and got business coaching, which we'll talk about later, was that Dean was very much a shiny toy guy. Um, he was always looking at the latest shiny toy and going down rabbit holes and trying things. And, um, you know, as the non-shiny toy guy who just has got too much work and just wants to get on and do the work, that was a bit frustrating. And so we had an accountability problem and a focus problem. So we did go and get a business coach, which we'll talk about later. But one of the things we did is, got a, is get a tech expert into our business to develop our tech strategy. So we've got a 10-point technology strategy. So every time we look at whatever we're doing in a tech area, we, we hold up the 10 points and we work out whether this fits the bill. But it's, I, just, it's just an instruction manual to tell Dean no. Exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> but he's bought into it because he, he realizes one of the things we did is we looked at our revenue years. And we could track when we were distracted from servicing clients' revenue went down or when we were focused on clients' revenue went up. What percentage? I'll be really interested to know. Uh, I don't don't know what the percentage was, but it was was significant. Because there'd be people out there who uh, have either recently changed CRMs or looking and there's no shortage of them and, and there's a lot of good stuff coming in. But it does. The cost is not just the cost. It's the cost of yeah. the time. And What's your break-even point? How long in times of dollars <laughs> spent missed clients? Because you've got to look at the lifetime value of a client. The client we missed 10 years ago at $10,000, that's $100,000 worth of revenue we lost just because we missed one client 10 years ago because we were distracted on something else. And I can tell you the engine room uh, concept is that the quite often CEOs or, 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 or will make a decision on technology and then they throw that decision into their practice manager mm. who has the role not only of, of, of implementing it but also being the psychologist to their team members who don't like change because no one likes change, right? So, yep. so quite often the unintended consequence is that you suffer attrition and whatnot because you've just changed the tools and they're not working. Now, um, also, quick, um, so you're obviously doing life insurance because you mentioned you've got yep. an insurance specialist. Yes. Um, is there any philosophy with the way you do that or, or um, maybe anything to add? Because it's, it's, life insurance has become a lot more specialised mm. and, and, and some would say more difficult to implement. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that you're doing that, that, that maybe our listeners could learn from? We had a very clear philosophy right from 10 or 15 years ago about the way in which we analysed insurance needs. And it was all about what's your income and expense, what's your expense need now and let's adjust that for life if there's an injury. So then let's just take away some of the income and see what your net position, what your cash flow position looks like. It was very much cash flow based. We weren't, you've got X number of debts and it wasn't an asset or liability based needs assessment. It was a cash flow based needs assessment. And we've got tools that do all of that the same way for every client. In terms of product specialty, you're absolutely right. Up until probably I'd say the major changes came through a few years ago, Stella was our insurance expert. I was the investment expert. She was the um, insurance expert. As that's evolved and as Stella's practice and desires have um, evolved, she's less interested in that. But that's one of the reasons why we've got Jan. She is an insurance Specialist, and is there anything that the, that the insurance companies could do to um, assist practice management? Look, I, I I actually think, and and I distance myself from insurance, so I have to say I'm, I'm not the best person to ask, and I do that deliberately. But because I've got high net wealth clients, not very many of my clients have insurance, um, and so I'm not in the trenches very much. Whereas other other people will have lots of insurance clients, and I think it's a, a great service. It's a great business. I take my hat up to the insurance companies. You can go onto TAL or any of those, and they are providing training after training after training. The issue is, does an advisor have time to keep up with it all the time? So I think they're doing what they can. I just, it's just one of those. Well, the only way tipping an, you over the edge thing about it's just almost too much. That's from right. Fire hose. Well, the the only way an advisor is going to get time is if they organise themselves correctly in a great environment, yeah. right? Which is what the, the whole thrust of of interviewing good practices. Is and about. as you said before, I think just like lawyers don't do all lawyering. There's estate planning lawyers. There's corporate lawyers. There's all sorts of lawyers. I think insurance in particular. Um, will become more and more specialised over time and you'll either have a specialist in your practice or you'll refer it out to a specialist. And I think that's probably the way it'll go. And on that topic, um, do, do you have professionals, uh, so estate planning, etc.? How does it operate for, for your, your high net worth clients? So we are predominantly a referral-based business 
Um, one of the thing, one of the other things we tried and failed in was we tried to create our own little multi-practice, multidisciplinary practice thing. But we had um, uh, an accounting firm, a legal firm, an investment arm, and a uh, the planning firm. We kind of they were all independent businesses, but we named ourselves as a group. So you, you a bit of a herding of cats was herding of cats, and what we found out was that two um, people weren't like. Each person wasn't marketing outside for themselves so that they were creating referrals within. They were just waiting on referrals from somebody else. Um, And other people wouldn't refer to you because you were like a a closed shop. So we, after two or three years, we disbanded that. So we we are very focused on building relationships with accountants. uh, Essendon, uh, Crestone Stanley Williamson is one of our our big supporters. RSM is a big supporter. Trover Tax is a big supporter, and so uh, we regularly meet with them and we maintain relationships and two-way flow. Um, estate planning lawyers, for many years we had a great relationship with Michael Schneider from Diamond Conway uh, and Jennifer Yeo. They both referred us our biggest clients at the time. They were $50,000 a year clients. So if you have a good relationship with lawyers, they might not be high-volume referrers, but when they do refer, it can be very valuable. And, and a, a quick look at your, your website is that you've um, you've got the divorce sort of as a, a bit mm-hmm. of a speciality, mm. and so and there's there's you've got your own backstory uh, as well uh, on that topic. Um, the clients that come to you because people don't refer their friends who they think are going to get divorced in three or four years to come and chat to you, right? It's quite mm. often. It's you're in the trenches. Yep. How do how does that business come to you, and and how does it work? Because there are some practices that that they put their hand up and say we're good at this, mm. but there'd be many people listening who get this every so often. Yes. So, as an expert, what would yes. your advice be? Uh, so, if that was something that you really wanted to get into, um, I would recommend looking up the collaborative law practices. Now, collaborative lawyers are people who work... It's it's a situation where each party gets a lawyer, but everybody, the four people, sign an agreement which says, if we don't um, uh, agree this without going to court, if anybody threatens to go to court or goes to court, all of this is undone and you can't use any of our work in the court process. Okay. And so so it's... I'm just... Collaborative law practices, if you Google that... Yeah. That'll be something that they offer as a service. Is that right? That's right. Now you have to get a you have to get credentialized. So there's a course okay. that you go on, and you become the financial planning member of the collaborative team, and that's where right. you get in during the divorce, which is great because what that person does, and it, you have to the licensee has to get their head around it, but that financial planner actually works. Um, for both parties in modelling up the outcomes that are being negotiated and helping them with the division of assets and what things are going to look like. They're not giving product advice. They're just modelling up the negotiated outcomes in a collaborative environment. Now, There's some pressure, isn't there? There is some pressure, but it can be really – it can be difficult but fulfilling. Um, It's enjoyable work if you like that sort of stuff. Um, but that's still in its infancy. There would be 5 or 10% of divorce practices out there uh, working on that basis. Most of them are still the adversarial one where you would have to work for one or either of the two parties. Uh, that can work too, but you're working on one. So not often enough do we get in during the negotiation phase, and I think that's a superly big opportunity for financial advisors because it's such it's so distressing. The people who never ran the money are confused, they're stressed, and the lawyers are just talking law and percentages. Nowhere in there does it say, how will you use your settlement to recreate your life? And that's what financial planners do. And if we can get in early enough and help them understand that, well, we're fighting over X hundreds of thousands of dollars now, but that's not going to make much of a difference to your life, but it's going to cost you another $150,000 in legal fees and another six months in heartache and maybe break your family so, up. Like so No lawyers were harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs> um, so, look, it's it, it's still not a big part of our practice, but, uh, like, I, I get referrals from Samantha Lewis, who's a, who um, is a fantastic divorce lawyer, um, Luke Shanahan from Queensland, we get referrals from him. So it's a... 
it's a small to reasonable part of our practice. Well, I think the takeout is that um, yeah, if, if, if anyone's interested in that, and um, although we didn't speak about this earlier, um, I see that as a specialised service like, for instance, aged care would be where mm -hmm. um, a, a practice might come across uh, uh, something complex like this every so often and it'd be interesting and not that you offer this service but mm. I'm just spitballing here it might be one of the the, the, the hyper sort of specialized offerings for financial planners to other financial planners in the future yeah, which we we might even run something called an ensemble on how that looks but um, yeah, yeah certainly I think um, a, a number of people would feel uncomfortable taking it on yeah and so if they did get a client who they were uncomfortable with because there are a lot of emotions and you've got to you know you've uh, there's a bit of a You've got to absorb quite a lot of stress and, and anxiety. So not everybody it's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, you've come from a family of psychologists, is what you said <laughs> earlier. So maybe it's maybe it's in the upbringing. Now let's talk about um, the the people and culture aspect of your business. Mm. Um, it's clear from what we've already spoken about that um, uh, everyone who joins you ends up becoming an owner of your business. So I normally like to say, what makes people join you, mm -hmm. what makes people um, grow and what makes people stay. We might have answered the stay bit already, but maybe give me a feel for what attributes or what values you want in your team members mm. and how you would how you would utilize that in taking on new team members. Mm. And so Dean and I worked out and I, I think we probably realized it when we started working with um, Roger Vatan um, from Leadership Counts. He was our first business coach um, and he was using the Entrepreneur's Operating System. And one of their quadrants is, or one of their things is your values. And the values is the DNA of the owners and the leaders, but the functional purpose of it is it's the lightning rod for how you distill into all of your staff who are going off and working anywhere from Philippines to here to Sydney to Melbourne, whatever, What's the lightning rod that they measure every one of their daily decisions by? And that is your values. Well, well Thor, we're ready. We're ready. <laughs> so um, so we've, got, we've got six values. Uh, it's do the right thing, constant improvement, be a team player, exceed expectations, um, enjoy what you do. I think that's only five. Um, I've, <laughs> I've, written, I've written be a team player twice. Um, there's another one. Um, we hire based on that. So when we're hiring people, we ask star questions like situation response um, around our values. So how have you demonstrated our values in the past? Yep. So we know that. We then talk about what our vision and value is and staff have got to get it. They've got to get our vision. They've got to want to be involved in our vision. And we are a service business and our purpose is to make our clients happier and more successful. So we need service-orientated staff who love making people happy and giving great service. So that's, that's the hiring process. Every month we have employee of the month and the way you win employee of the month is everybody else has got to vote for who they thought demonstrated our values best that month. Nice. So we get 15 stories of how people demonstrated our value every month um, and the person who gets the most votes wins that person gets $100 for themselves, um, but they also get $100 to give to charity. Um, so uh, that's another DNA part of our practice. We then have quarterly reviews, and the way we measure our staff is, did they live our values always, mostly, or sort of not always? And it's a pretty hard line. If you are consistently not living our values, then that's a red flag, and, and we would start to manage that out, um, either by trying to help them live the values or manage them out. Oh, sorry. The other uh, one of the goals is enjoy what you do, and so we don't want people in the practice who aren't on this journey that don't want what we want, and that's a very good way of, of aligning your staff. So then we have so quarterly reviews, annual reviews. We have monthly culture discussions. So we talk about our vision, our purpose monthly. We roll through a sort of there's about twelve monthly topics. We review every one of our values. We ask people what the what that value means. How do they describe it? How do they use it? So this values piece is deeply embedded in our culture and that's how we get people to behave in the way that we want them to behave. So when we were chatting earlier, you, you mentioned that um, a lot of your team are working remotely from each other mm. um, and having having sort of the, the lightning rod of, of values gives some commonality on bringing people together, whether it being electronic or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But from an operational perspective, yep. 
what's your meeting rhythms mm. with your with your team to for the execution of, of, of the services? So do you do daily or maybe give me a no. feel yes. for what the meeting rhythms are? So the, we would call that the meeting cadence. Um, and sitting behind the meetings, you've got to know what you're trying to achieve with each meeting. So with and so one of our beliefs is that you will only achieve what you measure. So every staff member has what we call a scorecard, which tells us whether all of the things that they need to be doing are on track or off track. And we only need to talk about the things that are off track. So we have a, a meeting with every specialist on Monday and we go through their scorecard and we identify anything that's off track and we solve that issue to remove the roadblock so that they can keep going for the week. And this is a curly one. You and Dean have a scorecard for yourselves. Well, uh, we, yes, we do. Because the business coach is the, the sort of, that's it's, right. it's funny because you, you almost, you guys coach other people mm. and I'm, I'm, and you did mention that mm. you, you've had someone coach before, but yeah, I was just, mm. just curious. Yes. So we have a scorecard for the business. Yeah. So we have scorecard for individual staff. Yep. And, and in, in my business, I'm an advisor as well. So I have the same sort of scorecard that an advisor has. Um, where we then we have a, a business scorecard. So a lot of those scorecards per member has to come down to one number. And that is really hard to figure out how each team member can have one or two numbers that so we can tell at a headline level whether they're on track or off track. So but we have developed it. So that's a business wide scorecard. Um, Dean has got some milestones within TWN that he's got that he's working on. The other thing that we do, which is probably more how we hold ourselves accountable, is that um, we operate at a business management level on a quarterly cadence. So we meet at the beginning of the year, we set our annual goals, our three-year goals and our 10-year goals. Yep. Then we break the first year's goals down into four quarterly runs. Yep. We each have um, rocks or goals that we need to work on and we have to report on our progress every week on our rocks because if you don't report on it every week, everybody tries to achieve their rock in the last month, in the last week before the end of the quarter. So break those rocks into milestones and are they on track or off track? So absolutely, we have a leadership scorecard. Oh, I'm completely aligned. I, I spent um, the last 20 years adhering to the Rockefeller habits or the- Yeah, that's where the, we started. The, and um, and uh, you're seeing from the same hymn book, it's always off-putting when, when rocks and rocks has to refer to himself in the first instance. <laughs> rocks is rocks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it, you really can't um, a quarter if you're- they're just hope. If you're doing goals over a year and you're not doing them, you, you just, it's just hope. It's not real. So That's um, one of the things that we- why we got a coach was because Dean and I became two good friends. And therefore, we would just let each other off all the time. And we needed a way to hold each other accountable without breaking our friendship. And this was the way. And we started at the wrong So, so Jan, Jan had a job description earlier. Now she's got her KPI. <laughs> hold us accountable. We, we absolutely, we think that's right. And um, tell me that, you know, the war on talent is extreme. Mm. And there's no doubt that you've got form in um, in, in bringing people in and... and um, teaching them to be better at their job. But these days, money's one part of it. You know, what purpose have you got? Um, I, I do note that you've got quite a bit of charitable um, uh, sort of endeavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I've, I've looked at that and it's, um, uh, I did spend three minutes trying to enunciate. Um, would you like me to say it? I would. Yeah. But before we do that, we'll, we'll go on to just give me an idea of, um, you know, your relationship with the system of the, the B1, G1. Mm -hmm. um, how that works because that's a, that's maybe a tool that we can put in the links for other mm. people to give mm. um, and then um, how that's played out and what, what charities that you're involved with, please, from sure. personally and, and corporately. And uh, um, shout out to Ben Nash, uh, one of the businesses that we helped uh, get up and running. Um, we can edit that out. Don't worry, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he found B1G1, which is one of the reasons we get a lot of benefit out of coaching all of these other businesses. Yeah. We get weekly input about what these other great practices are doing. Yes, we're giving to them, but they're giving back to us. So Ben found B1G1, and it's a micro-giving site. Um, if you go and read their story, it's all about how people would love to give, but they think they don't have a meaningful enough amount, and that stops them doing anything. And the whole Fractional is, philanthropy. Exactly. So this is a, a micro-gifting site um, with 
The other thing is, how do you find a charity you want to give to? Yeah. So this is a two-way uh, marketplace where gathering donations and helping people find the charities that they want to give to. So um, our staff in Cebu, there are a whole lot of charities based in the Philippines that they support, whether it's children or food or animal welfare or you put in your topic and they'll come up with charities that enable you to give that. And you can give anything from $1 through to as much as you like. But as I say, we give to them uh, regularly. And and look, um, when I talk tech stack, maybe in the future, the the charitable giving technology will be coming to Alexian. And well, um, they they if if you are wanting to promote your um, social endeavour, then they have a widget that you can put on your website, which shows all the the impact of all of your giving, and it's just a widget you embed in your website. Look, it's fantastic. I'm probably going to steal some of the intellectual property for one other one of my firms. Go for um, it. But um, that that sounds awesome. And and tell me about the. And the Wadji project? No, well, that's a good try. Good try. <laughs> um, the Angan Wadi project. So uh, this was a charity that I got involved in through one of my clients. Um, uh, it's So in, in the slums of India, um, there's uh, very poor hygiene, very poor environment for kids. Often the parents will go off and they'll work during the day and they, they need a system for looking after kids. And so their system over there is very small, community-based, really single-room schools um, where there is an appointed teacher, but that teacher looks after sort of prenatal, so um, pregnant women, um, nutrition, uh, post-birth, but then looking after the kids up until they're about five. Um, the Angamwadi uh, project is founded in the principle of community design. So we send architects over into these communities and there's a lot of community consultation about what it is that they want and need and then we design it and help build it. It's not about going in there and telling them what they need or just doing a cookie cutter approach. The community involvement in the design, the hours and hours that we spend with the teachers and the community to build something that works for them is probably the thing that sets this charity apart from some others. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the website at the moment and, um, uh, you're always open for new sponsors. I see your, your, your name there with, uh, with, um, in company with Herbert Smith Freehills and other startup firms. So, exactly. um, so exactly. if anyone, if anyone's interested in, in, in learning more about that or, or, or bringing their business in, I'm sure that you'd be open for that. Yes, look, we're, we're, we're always looking to raise money. That's why one of the, uh, firms on there is SMEC. They have a charitable giving, um, you know, part of their business and they help donate so we can build a school. Now we can build a school for about $20,000. Wow. Now, it's only, it, it, and it, it serves about 15 to 20 kids at any time, but do that year in, year out, year in, year out, and you're helping thousands of kids. It's tangible too, and, and your team yep. can get, get behind it. So, now that's awesome. And then with your, um, uh, with your team today, what sort of growth are you looking for? You've built a foundation, you've got some scalability there. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier, you know, 20 odd minutes ago around you want to um, work out the most efficient way to get to that 1.5 million of revenue mm -hmm. per advisor. Mm -hmm. um, are you looking to expand your advisor numbers or, or what's, what's your philosophy? So, uh, so not looking to expand our advisor numbers at the moment because I think we've built a team that can sustain probably uh, another 30% growth with yeah. maybe one more offshore staff. Um, so, yeah, that's a $35,000 worth of staff costs to grow a third bigger than we are now. Um, and that would be getting everybody, uh, all the advisors up um, to their target of $1.5 million. Yep. Um, so the way we're growing, though, is important. So uh, uh, I think word around is that, you know, those people who survived the last two or three years are now reaping the benefits. We've got a, a smaller advisor base. The quality of the advisor mm -hmm. base is good. The faith in the advisors is better. And so we've... We've had our best year of organic growth by 100%. Like we've just had double our normal new revenue. Congratulations. So that's been good. One of the things we've also did, have done over time is we did start a few joint venture financial planning firms where we would join with who we thought would be a great referral partner where um, we would run the business, they would bring the clients in. And for one reason or another, it didn't work as well as we'd hoped. So... Um, 
this year we bought both of those partners out and brought all of the clients that were in both of those businesses back into our practice. So we didn't have to pay all that, you know, we only had to buy 50% of it out. So it was a pretty, you know, not a reasonably economic way to grow. But we also bought a third party business out this year. So, uh, one of the things, so there's three ways, organic growth, partnership growth, um, and also buying acquisition growth. Um, one of the things with Dean's business where we get equity into um, startup firms, the way we always figured if any of these firms didn't work, we as, as a 25% owner could always buy the clients out from that advisor if they decided they didn't like it anymore. Like it was our way out. Sadly, I don't think any of them haven't worked out. Exactly. <laughs> so Shout out to all those firms. You know who you are. Exactly. But so really if – but. Probably, I, I probably said that a little bit wrong. The other thing is that we would look to bring some of those firms in. Like right. if they brought either a completely aligned or a divergent thing, uh, like approach that would add to our business, that's part of it's almost like an incubation thing. That if, yeah. if we ever wanted to merge, we, we could go to that. Um, and we know, and not only those ones that we have equity in, but we need to now do cash for coaching and any of those businesses where. You know, it would have to be what they wanted, but you know, that's a that's a, a pool of businesses that we know intimately, both the advisors and the business side. So if we were ever to merge, um, that would be the first place we'd go to. And um, I always like to ask um, about people's vision for the future. You know, I'm less concerned about vision for you know investments and whatnot. I'm I'm, mm. I'm sort of getting a want to get a feel for where you see. The business models going in mm. financial advice, mm -hmm. um, and then where you see yours fitting into it. Mm. I think there is going to be a, a bifurcation of the industry, um, like we already have. Eighty percent of the population don't have advisors. I think that's a space that technology um, can fill. It's very simple, like, but that's a fairly homogenous group of people. They have a mortgage. They've, you know, they want to. They've got money in super. Um, they want to put their kids through school. It's reasonably homogenous, and I think standard tech will solve that problem over time. But it will be a do-it-yourself model. Mm -hmm. I think the other twenty percent of the people, just like they'll pay for the pool to get cleaned, the car to get cleaned, the house to get cleaned, anything else that they don't want to do themselves, that end of the market don't want to go onto a website and do their financial planning themselves. They are happy to pay someone else. But the way that that will improve is through technology, where the technology drives is is a tool of the advisor, not a tool of the client. We've got a numbers problem with that statement. Mm -hmm. um, if if 20% of Australians sought financial advice, mm. we're about four times deficient advisors mm. given the current the current way in which they operate. Correct. And last time I looked, you can't become a financial advisor overnight. Mm. So the runway is there. So mm. are we are we suggesting, are you making the suggestion that advisors need to get used to dealing with two, three hundred family units in a year with support around you? That, or, 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 or what's 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 your? Well, that, that's label? exactly what we think the solution is. We think that the that the increasing advisor numbers is a long slow burn, and it won't keep up with demand. You know, it's really interesting. I see that that number thrown around fifteen thousand ARs, hmm. and it's sort of it, it's it's so simplistic that number because for every AR, there's associates, there's para planners, there's specialists, etc. So the industry is not those 15,000 mm. ARs. It's mm. everyone involved in the business of the business of financial advice, of which is what we're promoting. Correct. And the growth is actually going to come in those numbers. Exactly. And that's our point. We think the way forward is to make advisors more efficient. It's not about giving less service to more clients. It's about giving more service to more clients. And the only way you can do that profitably, and this industry has been focused on revenue for far too long, profit is important, not revenue. So in order to give quality advice and profitable advice, the only way to do it is to build up the skill base below the advisor. 100%. And a lot of um, uh, ensembles supported by a lot of corporate partners, and this particular podcast is, is one of those. But if you're a corporate partner, just... Just take into account that you need to be supporting the advisor's business and the other people, not just the advisor. 
Mm. Quite often they are aligned and they're ready to go. So, so, you know, we're happy that we're working with people to actually try and build those businesses. Mm. Now, um, I know that you've, uh, you're, you're short on time today, which is why we woofed down a, a sandwich together just beforehand. You've got a, a wonderful client you're about to I head am. off to. I um, am. I'd like All to. Good. I've got, I've still got. 20 minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I don't have to wind no, you up. No, I, I, he's, the meeting's only a few minutes away and I said I'd be there a few minutes after two, so we're good. And um, this particular client has, uh, what is it, uh, nine figures in the bank, so um, that, will, uh, that, that will do. So um, unbelievable. Now, so then in relation to um, your the, the vision of the future, we're talking about that efficiency play, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have spoke about the technology. You didn't actually mention, we, well, who do you use? Yeah, so our stack. So this 10-point um, strategy that we have boils down to really one principle. No shiny toys? No shiny toys. Two principles. Go to the second one. <laughs> so is, is that we try to use as few pieces of technology as possible. And yeah. we can basically get that down to two main ones. So we use um, SharePoint, Office 365, um, and we use Advisor Logic. We we don't add on widgets for do it. Like anything that we think we need to do has got to be available through one of those two things, or we are very wary about slotting in bespoke tech. Yeah, I mean that that small fledgling firm Microsoft has quite mm. a few features. Well, you know, now we can look at, um, you know, we can do our meetings on Teams. We can record our meetings on Teams. It can be transcribed in Teams. Um, we do our video, all of our training and meetings in Teams. We can book our meet. We can get clients to come and book their meetings in our calendar in Teams. Now you don't need a different piece of kit for all of that stuff. You can, but we will try and find the solution and live with its limitations in Office 365 rather than go and try something that's 5% better but now has to be linked into all of the other stuff and creates all the complexities of, of linking stuff up. I feel like that, that, that Microsoft wouldn't have made it better if there weren't those competitors over the last five or six years. Exactly, let's be honest. completely, but, we're, but we'll, take the, we'll take the benefit. No, exactly. And I, <laughs> and I actually, although this is not a tech um, a podcast, I, I feel that that's the same way with the incumbents in the tech advice delivery as well. I think without the um, the new competitors there, that, that, mm. that the incumbents probably wouldn't have moved the dial. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, and and I really hope that the that the small guys become the big guys. That's how it works. Mm. So, um, well, I've really enjoyed this session. Um, I've got bunches of notes. We've got things like the collaborative law practices, the the BG uh, B1 G1, G1 yep. system. We're going to put those links there. I'm probably going to reach out to Dean and talk about um, how spectacularly unsuccessful he's been in, in in taking on advice practices that fail that can merge into you guys because they generally don't fail. So that's um, right. we haven't merged with any yet. That's <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. So which is a delightfully ironic um, thing, and um, uh, it's always yeah, it's always a pleasure. The uh, one of the one of the in jokes here is that. That, that whilst Paul was doing this this podcast, he was gesticulating that much and hitting the table that we had our own backbeat halfway <laughs> through. So he's a passionate guy. If anything he says resonates, um, reach out to him and his team. And with that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to hope that Jan has listened to this. You're soon to she be practice be. manager. Yeah. Um, shout, shout out there. And to everyone else listening, have a great afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, anybody who w- would like to chat, Dean and I have this philosophy that our IP is the world's IP. We don't have any unique secrets about how we operate. So please feel free to reach out to me or Dean um, because we are passionate about the business of financial planning, both running ours well, but also through Dean, helping other practices be better financial planning businesses. Well, huzzah to that. Uh-huh. New series is coming out on Monday. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.